you know, being here at the MIM Museum is an absolute privilege, and to be able to spend time wandering the collection and just looking and marveling at all the pieces that are in the collection has been an absolute treat. And I've been lucky enough to spend the last few days just doing nothing but wandering up and down the aisles, taking photographs of just about everything, and spending a lot of time with Salim talking about the collection. One thing that actually kind of surprised me that I want to share with all of you is uh, the fact that I traveled, I believe it's something like 8,000 miles from my home to get here, only to arrive here and find uh, quite a few pieces from my father's former collections that are now here in the MIM. So just for fun, I'm gonna take you real quick and show you some of the pieces from my father's old collections that are now here in the MIM. So let's go, let's check it out. So we're walking down the main corridor here. On the left, as you've seen, are the uh, examples of the nine different uh, mineral classes. And right when you enter the main gallery, this is a uh, display case for the native elements. And the first piece I want to point out is that platinum nugget in the back there that used to belong to dear old Eduardo. And it's now part of the MIM Museum. So it's great to see that old friend here. Uh, let's see, over on this side, you know, my father used to work the uh, Bole mine in, uh, down in, uh, uh, near Santa Rosalia in Baja, California. And so right there, you've got some uh, pseudo boleites and some boleites. So the two pieces that are on matrix there, the upper one is the pseudo boleite and the bottom one is the boleite. Those were both part of dad's collection also. So great to see those here at the MIM. Uh, let's see, going down to this case, I believe. Yeah, this one is, uh, this is the oxides and hydroxides. And um, there are actually four in this case. So that uh, valentinite right there in the center there, that used to belong to, uh, to my father. And then on the same shelf, on the right there, that's uh, stotite. And that piece also was from the ERS collection at one point. Go down to the bottom here, we have that lovely crystal barrel right there. That used to be Dad's. And then, let's see, oh, we've got this one right here, Stibbleconite. That, uh, that used to grace my father's collection as well. So uh, four just in that one case. And then turning right around from there, we go to this case right here. And we zoom in right there. It's a lovely Ludlockite. That's that furry little orange thing right in the center of the screen. That was, uh, that was once Eduardo's as well. Uh, traveling over this way, this is the, the trophy section. And really some fabulous pieces kind of really called out, set apart. Again, I mean, just there's some things that just jump out and just grab you, and that Lagrandite certainly one of them. But uh, over here, just to the left of the Lagrandite, that right there, that Spangolite, that was once my father's, and uh, I believe that is still one of, if the not the, if not the finest examples of uh, Spangolite known. So. Used to be dad's, now it's part of the MIM. Really happy to see that here. All right, this case right here, right next to the uh, trophies case, that uh, parahopite, that used to be dad's. And again, and so far as parahopites, in terms of the, the cleanliness of that and the sharpness of the crystals, that again, could very well be just one of the uh, finest species, finest of species, the finest uh, parahopite para ever discovered. So, um, yet another friend here. Uh, let's see, over in this case, hi guys. Huh? Sorry. Uh, right there, that mimetite from Namibia, right in the front there. That mimetite used to be uh, my father's, and it's great to see it here. Beautiful mimetite. Turning around from that case, we've got this fabulous case right here with that wonderful um, snake-like uh, apophyllite coming, on, off, uh, coming down on the matrix. But uh, that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for right here is a pyrosmilite. And that piece right there, 
that was once dear old dad. So uh, fabulous to see it here. Rather ironic that it's taken, what, maybe more than 30 years and uh, thousands of miles to come back and see those pieces. Uh, I think we have one more piece over here. This is in the worldwide collection. And let's see. Here we go, right here. Discrosite. That is an Australian discrosite, and that was once father's as well. So 13 pieces, if my counting is correct. 13 pieces, formerly in the Edward Roy Swoboda collection, now are part of the MIM Museum here in Beirut, Lebanon. One other thing that's new here at the MIM Museum is that they have really taken a strong focus on fossils. And this area of Lebanon is one of the finest places to find fossils uh, in a certain uh, era. So we're going to go into the fossil room right here and we're going to take a look around at the fossils and then there's actually a, um, a show that's going to start any minute now. So let's take a quick look at the fossils and then we'll go and watch the show. Now about 100 million years ago, this was considered what we call the late Cretaceous period and Lebanon actually turns out to be the host of perhaps the most prolific source of fossilized marine animals from this late Cretaceous period. The quantity of fossils and the quality is unmatched anywhere in the world. Now, the Cretaceous period ended when a massive asteroid struck the Earth in what is currently the Yucatan Peninsula, and that the result of that impact eliminated over three quarters of uh, plant and animal species on Earth. Now, what we're looking at right there was a turtle. That was a fantastic turtle in the floor, lit with LEDs there. There we have, uh, looks like a skate and a ray, and I think we have uh, another skate here, and um, just a wonderful exhibit. Kudos to them. So now we are in the same room that you just saw with all the fossils on the wall and what they do is they darken the room and they have about seven or eight projectors that they then use to project images on the wall and those images tell the story. There's no or very little audio and what we're seeing here is the story of the sedimentation, uplift and erosion of Lebanon that allows these fossils to exist in their uh, incredibly prime state. Uh, this entire animation runs about 12 and a half minutes, so obviously we're not going to run the entire thing in this video clip, but this is just uh, to serve as an example. So you have that animation, now we're going to go on, and this is a continuation of it, it's telling the story of tectonic plates and the formation of the continents. And from here we're going to cut real quick to another por portion of it where they start taking individual fossils that are on the wall and blowing them up so that they fill the room. And it's actually an absolutely incredible effect. Great new part of the MIM Museum. One of the heroes of the fossil exhibit is this Mimodactylus right behind me here. And this is the most complete and finest specimen ever found of this uh, species. In fact, it was so new and it was so different, they had to give it a new name. And Mimodactylus is the name they give it uh, in honor of the Mim Museum where it currently lives. And this is the finest specimen ever found in the Middle East and in all of Africa. So. It's actually a very, very serious piece, and it's wonderful to look at. Okay, we're here in Biblos right now, and I'm with my friend Pierre. Yes. And Pierre Hello. is uh, one of the major suppliers of the MIM Museum for the marine fossils. Yes. And so we're going to go inside of his shop right here and take a look at some of the things that he does and how he does it. So Hello. shall we go? Welcome, my friend. Okay, thank okay. you. Yes. Yeah, you can put here. Okay, it's turn. There is a you shrimp here. It. Look at that. No, there is a shrimp here. You see? 
Yes. First time eyes have looked at this animal in a hundred million yes, years. Yes, yes, yes. yes, I said that. You know, and you are the first to touch it, to see it, we discovered. That's right. Since hundred million First years. human to yeah. ever touch yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, that's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Now you've seen live the uh, exposure of these small fish and shrimp, but look at some of these fabulous things here. And this represents, I would imagine, especially when we're going into the big ones up here, a lot of work. Yeah, because how many of these have you had to crack open? to find the treasures like that. That's that's not so it's, common. It's, it's 90 years of work. 90 years I of work. I'm the third generation in the family. My grandfather started and we work like eight to nine months every year. Absolutely. And every day from six o'clock until four. So you can imagine how much time. <laughs> now, do you do the chiseling in the field or do you we bring do it the out? the chiseling in the field. But when we find the, a part of the fish, we bring it to the fossil laboratory to prepare it and every day, every day at the excavation need at least 40 days at the fossil lab to, fin to finish what we of find. Of course, because at that point Excellent. you have to really slow down yeah, and do it carefully. The microscope with very sophisticated tools. and uh, Amazing. Here you can see a turtle, small turtle. Next to the turtle, we have a coelacanth. The coelacanth is the oldest fish still exist until today. In South That's Africa. right. They're living fossils. Yeah, yeah living fossil, flying fish. And look here, Brian. We have this uh, horseshoe crab. Oh wow! Next, we have a squid, and here it's an octopus, which is extremely rare. There is only now one, they have one, one, one at the meme. I've seen atmeme, that one at the meme. You know, there's only soft, no hard yeah. part. Yeah, that's the thing with all cephalopods, yeah. which are octopus and, and squids. Yes, the only hard part yeah. generally is the yeah. beak. Yeah. So to leave an impression yeah. like that, it's super fantastic. Yes, yeah. super. shrimps, lobster, they didn't change until today. The lobster still have two arms, one to with, with claws. Uh, yeah, and the other ones to, to, to grab. To grab. Yeah, uh, plants. And uh, look here, it's a fish which is swallowed another fish. Oh, I see the second fish, yeah. But it's a, you can see it's a predator one, it's easy. And also here we have shark, look at the teeth. Examples that you can identify the shark uh, very easily. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this is interesting in the shark because you see backbone, the backbone, but sharks have no bones. Yes. This is all cartilage, like yes, we have at the tip yes, of our nose. Yes, yes. They're called cartilag cartilaginous animals. And here you have a soul fish. You can soul see examples of part which we see here, and this backbone is there. It's a positive, negative one, mirror image. There we go. I saw sawfish in the in the, uh, the, the video at the, the mim. Ah, yes, yes. But I was thinking, oh, I haven't seen a uh, a fossil of one. But here it is. And are these are the teeth that are on the saw. Example like this one. A fish is eating another fish in the. You can see it. You can see it in the mouth. In yeah. the mouth. And time stopped here. You can see it. Here's in a the... close-up picture of that. <laughs> Superb. Super. Look at this one, the variety of species. Lebanese fish fossils have best conservation in the world. We can see the soft part fossilized, same as the hard part, like the, the skin, everything. And which is important, we, we find here the largest variety of species in the world. In Lebanon. What is it about the strata in Lebanon that preserves the soft parts of the fish? It is it is very fine uh, line. Fine gr okay, yeah. fine grain. Grain, yes, of course. And uh, the condition was excellent. It was covered in a place without oxygen, very quickly. So this oxidation inside the water, the quick sedimentation, mm -hmm. the kind of the sediment, and other factors gives this quality of fossilization. Well, now, in this part of the world, it's very, or it used to be very uh, active seismically. Yes. So is it possible that some of the earthquakes created kind of mudslides that no, would no, no, added no. to that? No, 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 no. rain bring a lot of plankton, absorbs the oxygen, and okay. poison who kills the fish. And <laughs> what, what, what you call it in English, red tide or algae bloom. It's, sure. It's happened here. Yeah. It still happened. Uh, you know, I was telling you about the variety of the species, the importance of these sites. Example, in the United States, you know Wyoming, Green mm -hmm. River, it's a very important site where we can find fish fossil. Right. The surface of the land is 30,000 square kilometers, three times bigger than Lebanon. In Wyoming, we have 29 different species of fish. 
in Lebanon. Until today, we have 450 different <sighs> species identified, and maybe we have the double of this number of new species. So no country in the world have... Nothing compares species. to that. Very high density of species diversity here. Yes, yes. Incredible. It's, it's wonderful to see. You know, from the perspective of the MIM Museum that started as a mineral-only museum, uh, there's a certain amount of sadness that there's not a lot of mineralization yeah. and specimens that we find in Lebanon yeah. that represents the country. Yeah. But what we lose on that side, we gain so much on the fossil side. Yes, yes, Some incredible course, things here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Nice to meet you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs>